Um, the purpose of this series is to bring the audience some information they might not otherwise have about oxygen imaging technology and a variety of applications. They're doing an amazing job of bringing together speakers from ac academia and industry to talk about a variety of topics. And also to just let everyone know that if you have friends who couldn't make it today's session, the recording will be available soon for people to look at after the fact. So to get to the topic for today, um, our speaker is Dr. Sally Piaz from New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. She's gonna be talking about molecular modeling changes, how we interpret oxygen measurement. So she's bringing a modeling approach to our data analysis. So she has a background in a chemistry degree from Emory. Then she got her PhD at New Mexico State University, where she did a combination of NMR and molecular dynamic simulations. She then got a computing innovation fellowship to work on molecular dynamic systems. And she was mentored by Carla Simmerling at Stony Brook. While she was there, she became interested in EPR through work with a collaborator who is studying HIV protease. In 2012, she joined the faculty at New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology in Socorro, New Mexico. There, she established a research group with a focus on oxygen, tissue oxygenation and membrane level oxygen transport. She's an active member of the International Society of Oxygen Transport in Tissue, known for short as ISOT. In 2016, she received their prestigious Melvin Knisley Award for Young Investigators, which has helped support her work in this area. Just as a preview before we go into her talk, letting you know what's coming up next in this series, the next presentation will be on December 10th by Mark Saitlin from West Virginia University, talking about his rapid scan imaging methods and applications. So without further ado, I think we should turn this over to Sally and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. So I'll stop my screen share and turn it over to you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Sandy. Sally. Hi, Dr. Bruley. I'm so excited that everyone's here. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity we have to do this. Um, it's one of the benefits, I suppose, of the pandemic that we've learned how to get together uh, cross distance. So I'm excited to be able to do this and quite honored to be invited. So today I'm going to tell you about some work we have done that relates to uh, EPR oxygen measurements. And I think the audience will be fairly familiar with EPR, but if you uh, would like me to say more about that, please do um, speak up and, and let me know so that I can fill, so that the context will be clear. So I'm going to share my screen. I think I can do that. So the talk today is titled Molecular Modeling Changes How We Interpret EPR Oxygen Measurements. And this is reporting on some work that we've been doing for a number of years, and um, in particular on a study that was recently published in a special issue of the Applied Magnetic Resonance, which was in honor of Hal Schwartz's 85th birthday. The context of the work is that we are looking at oxygen transport and the effect of membrane cholesterol on oxygen transport. Oxygen delivery is a critical uh, parameter for cellular function and tissue function. We know that cells require oxygen uh, for normal metabolism. <clears throat> 
And in particular, oxygen is a critical parameter for both tumor survival. Um, so the lack of oxygen tends to promote tumor survival and also for radiotherapy because it's critical to have oxygen inside of the cells um, when they're being targeted with radiotherapy because the uh, kill rate or the efficacy of the radiotherapy is enhanced greatly by the presence of oxygen, about three times enhancement um, in the presence of oxygen. And so there is a clinical interest in measuring oxygen in tissues. But cholesterol, which is a membrane component, it's actually a normal part of cell membranes, um, is found, has been found to decrease oxygen permeability of membranes through some work that was uh, done by uh, Carl Subjinsky's group. And quite a few other studies have supported this, but primarily the technique used in understanding the impact of cholesterol has been um, based on an EPR technique. And this work based, we, we actually started out to um, use this as a, a benchmark in our studies. So we do um, molecular dynamic simulations and I wanted to bring more insight to the process of cellular oxygenation. Um, but we found when we started doing the work that there was um, some uncertainty in the interpretation of the EPR measurements um, because the probes, uh, the EPR probes have um, variable positioning. So I'm going to show you some more detail on that. What do the probes look like and um, what do we think may be going on with the probe positioning? But this has led to really uh, reevaluating the effect of cholesterol on oxygen uh, transport across membranes. So this is an image mainly to show you what cholesterol looks like. Um, so it's, a, it's, most people think of it, especially in the biological world as being a rigid molecule. So it has a set of uh, rings, which are here. Actually, I was just going to try to show you my, uh, let me get the pointer. Okay, so the ring structure um, is here. And this is uh, a rigid system because of the way that the bonds are formed. And then we have a little tail on there that is dynamic, um, but this orients in a, a head to tail fashion. So the head over here and a tail over here with um, membrane phospholipids and incorporates into membranes. But it's important that we consider the impact of um, membranes on oxygen flux and oxygen access to the inside of cells, because in most experimental um, studies, and virtually all actually, especially in clinical, uh, in the clinical setting, the probes for oxygen are placed outside of cells. So they could be, typically they're either in the blood or in the um, extracellular uh, interstitial fluid, so surrounding the cells. But there are intervening membranes, and in a tissue, there are actually quite a few of these. And um, each one has an associated permeability. So the membrane itself has a permeability to oxygen. And here I'm um, addressing the question of permeability in relation to cholesterol content of the membrane. So here is an image where I have constructed a, a model, uh, just imagining uh, delivery of oxygen two cells that are inside of a tissue and somewhat distant from a capillary. So the capillary is on the left with this sort of circular shape. And then we have a red blood cell in the capillary. And the oxygen, as we know, is carried in the red blood cells, but then has to be released to the tissue. And at that point, as far as we know, the oxygen travels using a diffusive process across the tissue and we have actually devoted quite a bit of effort recently to understanding the pathway of diffusion, but we know that that pathway must involve at least one cell membrane and probably, and, and more than one probably organellar membrane. So we have to at least go into the mitochondria and, and then across the outer membrane and into the inner membrane. And we have a mitochondrion shown over on the right um, as in part of this image. So the idea is that we, we need to understand oxygen levels um, away from the capillary and away from the red blood cells, but 
our techniques for measuring are typically either extracellular or in the vasculature. And so we need to understand the impact of these um, membranes on oxygenation. And here I'm specifically addressing the um, measurements that were done using EPR oximetry, um, which is a measurement technique um, for oxygen using EPR, and um, then comparing that with molecular simulations. And this is just an, an, an image to give us a, a micrograph, uh, or it's a micrograph of a, a red blood cell in a capillary to give you, you can actually see, it might be a little difficult over Zoom, but um, there are many membranes in between and it's likely that oxygen has to cross multiple membranes in order to access cells. But in particular, it's important to consider cholesterol as a factor because red blood cells, so this one is shown in this dark area here in the micrograph, um, red blood cells have 50% cholesterol in their membranes approximately, which means that 50% of the lipids in, in the red blood cells are cholesterol. And that's probably because red blood cells have to um, undergo deformation when they enter capillaries and then have some elastic properties as well. And cholesterol helps to strengthen the membrane and allow it to um, respond to those physical changes and remain intact. However, that can also, um, prior work has shown that cholesterol can have a large impact on the um, oxygen flow across the, the membrane itself. So this is um, a slide just showing the paper that we have, that I'm going to pre be presenting most of the data from. Um, so this is titled Atomistic Simulations Modify Interpretation of um, Spin Label Oximetry Data. And this is a part one um, of a two-part study. It's uh, intensified water lipid interfacial resistances. So we're going to be focusing on how EPR uh, probes were used to measure oxygen going across a cell membrane, and then comparing that to molecular dynamic simulations to modify the interpretation really of the EPR's um, data. This work was carried out primarily by um, a graduate student I had who graduated now um, and is doing very well. His name is uh, Gadi Anglis. And the experimental work that I'm going to be comparing against for the most part in this study um, is uh, carried out by Carl Sobczynski's group. Um, and in particular, the first author of the, the paper was uh, Justina Vidomska. Um, and we'll be doing a pretty detailed comparison with this work. So the context here in terms of what kind of lipids we're talking about, um, you don't need to know a lot of details about lipids to um, follow this, I think. But so we had um, a typical membrane phospholipid, which is called POPC. Um, so it's um, palmetto, one palmetto oil, two oleol phosphatidylcholine. And we also are using 50% cholesterol in some membranes. So it's just a two, um, two conditions in terms of the lipid content. We have membrane um, simulations that are set up with oxygen in the system. The red uh, spheres represent oxygen. The gray spheres here represent water. Um, so these are hydrated by layers. And then we use periodic boundary conditions to give the simulation the impression that it's infinitely um, wide so that we, we can take a very small piece of membrane that has all the atoms in it, it represented in it, um, but then run simulations which involve dynamics over time. Um, and we can uh, project behavior that, that belongs to a, a larger scale, um, you know, something that's closer to the, the behavior of a full um, cell membrane or, some, or a model membrane. So the, the take home here is that we have two conditions in there's cholesterol in one system and POPC in the other. And you can see physical changes, just your, your eye will show you the impression that there are some physical changes and I will um, highlight some of those as we go through. But one of the primary ones is that cholesterol makes the membrane more um, kind of rigid and also uh, stretches out the lipids and creates a wider thickness. Um, but then um, it's also having some effect on the oxygen localization in the membrane. 
So this is a, a movie that I'm going to show you, and I don't know how it will read on Zoom. It could be that it looks very um, jerky for you, but I'm going to show it because I want you to understand that this is a dynamic type of simulation. We are not um, simply uh, th that the molecules are moving, okay? So it's not exactly, uh, it's not static. If I can figure out how to play it, let's see. Ah, okay. So in this case, we have a 50% cholesterol membrane. So it's similar, it's the same as the one I showed you on the previous slide, except cholesterol is shown here in white instead of in yellow. And uh, we have oxygen molecules, which we've enhanced the concentration of oxygen here in order to improve our statistical sampling um, so that we can calculate thermodynamic properties from the, the simulations um, on a short time scale. So what I've shown you here is just two nanoseconds of simulation, but we typically run on the order of two to 300 nanoseconds and sometimes up to a microsecond of simulation. Okay, so for POPC, um, I'm going to show you in the next slide uh, a trace where we took one oxygen molecule and followed its path across the bilayer and specifically going to be looking at the pathway going across. Um, so we're going um, you know, from the water layer on one side to the water layer on the other side. Um, and then we'll see movement within the membrane. So this will show you some difference between POPC and POPC with cholesterol in the pattern of oxygen movement. So starting on the left, actually it's on the right. Uh, we start on the right, we have zero time point, but it's, it doesn't really matter which direction you go, but you can trace the oxygen path from out in the water layer into the membrane, and then it's traveling inside the membrane um, for a period of time, and then it comes back out into the water layer and then re-enters. So this is a sample for you of what kind of data we have in terms of counting oxygen entry and escape events. So leaving the bilayer is considered an escape. And we have some boundaries defined. So over here, I have kind of ghosted in the membrane to show you the boundaries of the head groups and uh, the tail region. So you notice that oxygen spends most of its time in the tail region. And that is because it is um, hydrophobic or uh, nonpolar and is not um, highly water soluble. Okay, so that's what we find for POPC. And then when we look at simulations for POPC with cholesterol, we see something a little bit different, but it's a similar pattern, but you can see some stru structural uh, differences that lead to um, a difference in really how much time oxygen spends in the bilayer. So we see oxygen entering, but notice that it spends some time kind of, it's actually right under the, the head groups of the phospholipids near this, what becomes a fairly rigid um, surface that does not have, we think, uh, does not have uniform entry points. So it has, um, the oxygen cannot easily insert at any, um, at every point. It has to actually find an entry point into the membrane. And then it can, um, so it stays in that region for a period of time and then it comes in and this particular oxygen only leaves the membrane one time during the simulation. And so we see really less frequent escapes out of the membrane. Um, but what will, you will find interesting about this and something that puzzled me for a number of years and maybe to a, an extent still does, I'm trying to understand it fully. Um, the permeability of the membrane itself, which means the ease with which oxygen can pass um, through ends up um, being very similar for, based on our calculations between cholesterol and POPC, even though the, the oxygen spends a lot more, each individual oxygen spends a lot more time in the membrane. Um, and so there's some optimization, I think, biologically that has led to this relatively high permeability, even though the cholesterol is significantly altering the physics of oxygen movement in the membrane. And this is showing a calculated parameter, which is electron density. And this is something we can compare against um, X-ray diffraction and related um, studies. 
that um, or that characterize bilayer properties, so lipid bilayer physical characteristics, and it allows us to not only describe the structure of the membrane uh, in terms of really how much density is there of the atoms um, at certain points. So you see in the head group regions for POPC, we see a rise in the density and then a low density in the tail region where there's a lot of movement of the atoms. And then on the right, we have POPC with cholesterol and you see a rigid ring structure area, which is um, caused by the presence of those cholesterol rings um, and so it's a tightly packed area that is generated really within the, the lipid tails also um, in the tails stretch out and cause this kind of higher density in that area. And you get a little bit lowering of the density in the head group area, which actually increases the permeability. So it's one of the factors that tends to promote higher permeability, even though oxygen is spending more time in, this, in the center of the membrane. So coming back to the traces here, this yellow shaded area where oxygen is not spending much time corresponds with that um, cholesterol dense region over here on the right. Okay, so the next uh, factor that I want to show you is that we have done a lot of validation of the physical properties of our simulations. And here, I will not go through the details here, but I want to say that we have compared our simulation data with um, these biophysical studies of, of membranes and have shown that we have really very good agreement in uh, thickness parameters. So it's actually given the error bars um, essentially identical between our simulations and the uh, experimental data. And these are based on electron density um, maps that, like the ones, or the electron density curves like the ones I showed you. And then also the hydrophobic thickness is very close and the area per lipid, um, which is a measure of um, the, the membrane, how tightly packed the lipids are um, in the plane of the membrane. And then we applied a regional model to our membranes. And again, I won't belabor it, but you can see a lot of labels on here. And we used experimental um, data combined with prior theoretical studies that divide the membrane into um, sections so that we can look at certain sections as being important to the transport process. So it's, it, this process breaks down into um, regions that have a certain impact on the permeability. And so we've done that, but we've also added labels that indicate um, the region that is studied in the EPR um, experimental studies versus what we find to be uh, the boundaries of the membrane from um, molecular dynamic simulations. So in particular, okay, so this um, just shows you that we, we used the prior uh, regional model that are labeled one through four in Roman numerals. And then we have added additional boundaries um, using these um, Arabic, Arabic numerals. And then finally, the, um, the one that I wanted to, to highlight because it will come up um, repeatedly is that the molecular dynamics boundaries in terms of where the edges of the membrane are um, are both consistent with experiments, including those that were used for interpreting the EPR study I'm going to show you with com for comparison. Um, but the EPR region uh, in terms of where the probes are is narrower, okay? So that the EPR region falls here um, in this uh, six bar, which is primarily the hydrophobic uh, portion or the nonpolar portion of the membrane whereas molecular dynamic simulations show that the membrane should be, uh, has a, a wider breadth. Now, what we're going to be comparing in particular relates to spin label oximetry studies. So these are using uh, electron paramagnetic resonance or EPR probes, um, which have a nitroxide moiety on it, which is, it has an unpaired spin and that unpaired spin responds to the presence of oxygen because oxygen O2 also has unpaired spins. Um, and so those interact with each other physically and uh, this can be measured using a, a relaxation techniques, spin relaxation techniques. And um, in particular, the 
Um, probe that we end up comparing a lot with is called tempo um, phosphatidylcholine or, uh, or tempocholine. And it has the probe placed in the head group area of a phospholipid. So you can see the phospholipid part here, the tails. And then where the head group would usually be, um, a tempo, tempo probe has been added to the phospholipid. And we note uh, as chemists that the kind of chemical nature of this structure is primarily nonpolar. And so we hypothesized that this would be hydrophobic and would tend to prefer association with the nonpolar part of the membrane. Now, this is just showing you equations that are used within the EPR study to characterize um, the, what is called oxygen transport parameters. So where the oximetry um, is taking place or how it's being done um, is that the spin lattice relaxation measurements in air and in nitrogen are, uh, one is subtracted from the other um, because there's, uh, I believe it's a line broadening effect um, but there is some difference in the, the spectrum um, in air versus in the, uh, without air, so with oxygen versus without oxygen. And that allows for calculation of this oxygen transport parameter or the oxygen contribution to the spin lattice relaxation. And from that, the authors of the EPR work um, suggested that the, um, the oxygen transport parameter represents the product of the oxygen concentration at a given well, bilayer right setting. The, uh, session. Um, who's this? Oh, for gosh, sixty. But I want to talk to you. Thank you. Um, so the the EPR authors or the authors of EPR were um, indicated that the. Um, oxygen transport parameter represents the product of the oxygen concentration times its diffusion coefficient, or it's called the solubility diffusion of oxygen, which is typically measured in many probe-based studies because um, oxygen has to be both present and moving in order to generate the types of signals that are um, occurring due to, um, pro or that to cause a probe to respond to the presence of oxygen. And then there's a scaling factor that's used, and I won't go into the uh, scaling factor right now, but it relates to the collision of oxygen with the probe. And then in our simulation study, we did something similar um, and just modified the equation a little bit to ac account for the presence of um, the probe itself. And so we have a factor that is introduced that represents the mole fraction of the probe um, within the membrane in the EPR studies so that we could do a comparison. But so we're, this oxygen transport parameter uh, represents the solubility diffusion of oxygen in the membrane. And here I'm going to show you data. So now we have data from simulation in the black curve for the oxygen transport parameter as a function of bilayer depth, which is the Z uh, dimension. And in the, the black circles, we have EPR data from um, Carl Sipchinski's group. And we see that in the region that um, is shared between the two plots in terms of bilayer depth, we have um, a fairly close match um, in value between the simulation data and the EPR data. The major difference is in the head group region. So the um, EPR studies assign the position of their head group uh, targeted probe, the tempocholine probe, which I showed you. Um, the, they assigned its position to uh, around minus 16 or pl plus or minus 16 angstroms from the bilayer center. And for us, um, the head group uh, density occurs farther out and that's confirmed experimentally that the head groups are, are placed out here. So the EPR probe is measuring somewhere in this area um, or possibly a little deeper, we think. Okay. But in, when cholesterol is added, we see an increase of um, the, actually in the, the simulation study, we see an increase of oxygenation in the very center, which is not detected um, by the EPR study, probably because the probes cannot, um, they really don't sample that central region. And so, our, our peak is probably exaggerated, or in fact, we are pretty confident that it is exaggerated, maybe by a factor of two, 
in the center because of a, um, a limitation of our physical model. However, we do think there's an enhancement of oxygenation there. And we see very good agreement overall with the shape of the curve um, when we have POPC with cholesterol. Now, based on these, um, these oxygen transport parameter curves, um, the, there's another parameter, which is actually more closely related to the EPR um, measurements, which can be calculated, which is the inverse of this curve. Okay, So um, this one reflects more like the concentration curve of oxygen, whereas the next one is the inverse concentration, um, which is called the resistance to permeation. So this is the inverse of that one. And they're the same plots, but just um, one over uh, the value at each bilayer depth. And we see this represents more, it's similar to free energy in that it represents barriers um, and um, really a landscape of uh, barriers and sinks along um, going across the bilayer. And we see that in the EPR region, um, we have again, good agreement, um, but then we see a very large spike of resistance to permeation at the interface between the lipids and the water. So in this area, and in the cholesterol um, containing uh, system, we see an additional spike, which is generated by the cholesterol rings. And that is, we think, we're not quite sure. In this case, we think that this value may be, uh, again, exaggerated. And um, we, we can't explain um, the magnitude difference here. Um, but keep in mind that this parameter is very sensitive um, to the curve here. So these are the same, except they're the inverse. And so the inverse curve ends up being very sensitive to the exact value in this area, where if we compare oxygen transport parameter, they look close, but they look farther away in the resistance to permeation. But the primary difference here between the two is this spike in the interfacial area. And we have done some additional comparison to try to tease this out. What's going on and um, how do we interpret the APR data um, relative to the simulation data? And so we uh, brought in some uh, NMR data, so nuclear magnetic resonance data, which is a probe pre technique. Now it has its own limitations because one of the main issues is that the oxygen has to be highly concentrated uh, or very high partial pressure, 30 bar. Um, to which is approximately 30 atmospheres, um, to be able to measure um, paramagnetic shifts um, based on the presence of oxygen. But it allows for um, an independent uh, evaluation of the oxygen uh, profile. And it's very similar to oxygen transport parameter, but it generates a concentration curve. Okay. So on the left, we have a, the, a, the experimental data set from that paper um, but then it's been, uh, I've processed it in the sense of just normalizing it. So this is a normalized concentration to where CW is the concentration of the oxygen in the water layer. So you'll note that on both curves in the simulation part and the um, experimental part, they both end on one because that's the reference point. Okay. So you notice that our, um, in our simulation, which is a different lipid, but they're very similar. Um, and so there's not expected to be a huge difference. We do have an exaggerated peak in the center, and we know that that's because of our oxygen model. Um, and we also see a bit more detail in the center. So in the middle, the NMR study loses um, resolution. It, it simply doesn't measure in the middle of the membrane, or it's possibly averaging across multiple states here because um, it's using carbons um, to track the, its chemical shift related to carbon-13. And um, those carbons have to be present in the center. And in the very middle of the membrane, they um, really don't spend very much time and they also move around a lot. So we see overall the shape of the two curves is relatively similar. You, you see also a little kink here, which has to do with the double bond in the phospholipids. And then a dip at the head group region um, that's more defined um, in the simulation study, but these positions that are assigned for the NMR study are based on average positions of the carbons, and so it's not as resolved. But if we transform those data to a, um, an inverse um, plot, okay, so essentially the same thing that we did with the EPR data, so we could compare the resistance to permeation. 
This is the concentration contribution to the resistance to permeation curve. So we're missing the diffusion coefficient, but based on a lot of work, it, uh, it's likely that the diffusion coefficient does not contribute significantly to the curve. Um, but so over on the left, we have the NMR uh, part. And notice that there's a spike of resistance here that would not be detected if we look only at the EPR region. Um, this is, these are the boundaries that are included in EPR. And the peak in EPR occurs um, about where I've indicated on that uh, plot. So um, we see a, a, an interfacial resistance that's consistent with the simulation. And so this is some independent uh, validation of our study um, so that it suggests that we have uh, a, a meaningful, um, you know, a, a meaningful assessment of the interfacial resistance. Now, why is this so important? It's very similar to, if you're familiar with transition state theory um, with the, um, like a free energy uh, barrier, these barriers contribute uh, to the, uh, they, they reduce the rate of diffusion. Okay, so these are the primary contributors to um, the permeability, which is a rate constant um, that relates to uh, flux, um, which it, it's essentially a first order rate constant. Okay? So we have um, a much larger spike of resistance in the head group region um, compared to the EPR studies, which are only detecting this lower region down here. And that contributes to differences we find in permeability. Okay. So the EPR studies are focusing on this, just the tail region, whereas we're capturing, actually, I think it's the interface of the lipids themselves with the water that's generating the greatest resistance. And what we think happens um, with the EPR probe, um, which I showed you in the prior slide, the tempo probe, our tempo choline probe, is that it actually bends. Um, this is based on some additional simulation work, which will be part two of this study. Um, and um, that uh, the probe spends most of its time under the head groups. It's meant to be detecting out in the head group region and at that interface and catching the lowest concentration of oxygen. But because of the physical nature of the probe, it's, um, I think it's both physically excluded because of its bulk and also um, its non-polarity or, or hydrophobicity tends to cause it to dip down into the tail region. And it's most likely detecting oxygen in that region, which explains the difference between our um, results in the uh, head group area compared to the EPR studies. And when cholesterol is added, uh, that probe is a bit more dynamic, which also helps to explain um, why the cholesterol um, curves that we've generated are more similar to the EPR study than the POPC curves. Now, the, the, the take home message here um, is that the, the EPR study calculates from this um, permeability, okay? So using the probes that are placed throughout the membrane, um, permeability is calculated and um, the, Estimation based on the EPR studies is that cholesterol reduces oxygen permeability by a factor of at least three. Um, so three to five times um, slower permeability or lower permeability when you have 50% cholesterol compared to POPC. Now we've reassessed that and I'm going to give you some more um, detail on that comparison. Okay. And we're going to be calculating from the simulations, we calculate the permeability in two ways. And I don't really want you to focus on the specifics of the equation. It's not a lot of time to digest it. But primarily I'd like you to note that one of them is based on the area under the curve for the resistance uh, to permeation. And then taking the inverse of that gives us permeability. And that's how it's, cal how it's calculated from experiment as well. Um, but we've done that uh, with our simulation. So it's an integration method it's a very typical way of assessing permeability. But we have also um, used a technique which is um, less model dependent and um, with sufficient sampling um, should be more accurate, um, which is a counting method where we have tracked oxygen movement over uh, time through the membrane and then counted how frequently it leaves the membrane and then scaled that um, based on the amount of oxygen in the water um, so we get a, it's treating this as a first order process and we calculate a rate constant from that, the, the permeability coefficient becomes our uh, rate constant. 
So we have the integration method and the counting method, and we're going to compare those as well with simulation. Okay, so you see that here um, in this main table, and I'll break this down for you. It, it's always overwhelming to me when I see a lot of uh, numbers on the screen. So I'm just going to break it down and show you some of this. Um, but primarily on the top, we have the EPR experimental data, which is based on um, Karl Sapczynski's work. Um, it's using an integration technique um, based on the resistance to permeation curves calculated experimentally. And then we have um, EPR, um, we, we have molecular dynamics data. So MD stands for molecular dynamics, um, using either the integration technique or the counting technique in both cases. But we've looked at if we calculate um, the permeability only based on the EPR region. So if we assume those are the boundaries and calculate the permeability, we get some set of values. And then if we calculate it um, using the whole bilayer, we get a different set of values. So to start out with, I'm only going to focus on, we've done two temperatures and so it's 25 degrees Celsius and 35 degrees Celsius. And I'm only going to focus on the 35 degrees Celsius or 308 Kelvin part closer to body temperature. And then um, this is the experimental comparison. So experimentally, there's a reduction of three times um, going from uh, just POPC to POPC cholesterol. And this is the oxygen permeability. Now, we find that if we take into account just the EPR region and use the molecular dynamic simulations to calculate permeability, we see a two times reduction uh, using the integration technique and actually a little more than three times reduction um, using the counting technique. And I, I would explain to you, I, I don't think I have time to explain why we think there's a difference. Um, note that in POPC with cholesterol, the integration technique and the counting technique do not agree fully. Um, and I think I it's kind of intriguing actually because there's a physical phenomenon I think uh, going on, but I won't go into it, but we can discuss it after if anyone's interested. Okay. But so then um, if we compare then um, the values between the EPR region calculation, which is say um, around, let's, the counting technique I think is a bit more accurate. So um, we have somewhere around 80 centimeters per second um, for the POPC. Um, then if we take the full bilayer into account, we have a major reduction in permeability. So this is from the same simulation, but just taking into account the interfacial region, um, we see a major reduction in um, permeability uh, within the same uh, simulation system. And then for POPC cholesterol, it's not as dramatic, okay? So if you take the EPR region and compare that to the um, full bilayer region, it's a factor of two reduction, um, but it's not a, a, as huge of a difference. And so ultimately what we find is that the permeability of a POPC bilayer and a POPC cholesterol bilayer is pretty similar. Um, though the EPR studies um, have shown based on the probe-based technique that they're very different. So a three times difference, whereas we see more like, with our best estimate, we think it's about 20% uh, reduction in permeability. And I've focused here, just highlighted that we think those are our best estimates um, using the counting technique. And this, this just brings in a discussion from um, really actually one of the things that has helped us to be confident that we may have something valid is that an early work by uh, Diamond and Cutts, um, which was published in 1974, um, indicated that uh, there's a strong interfacial resistance for um, this is, they called them non-electrolytes, but essentially uncharged molecules going across a bilayer. And in particular, nonpolar ones um, were predicted by this study. Um, so this is just a theoretical, um, based on, based on but, uh, lots of data, um, but Diamond and Katz suggested that there would be potentially a very large resistance for nonpolar or nonpolar molecules going across a bilayer. Um, but some of them might have a smaller interfacial resistance, but it's still an interfacial resistance where the EPR region is really in, in the um, oxygen oximetry studies is really focusing on this region here. So it's not really catching either one of those spikes in resistance. And Diamond and Cutts have proposed that um, the integ integral of the resistance, the permeation um, needed to be modified with interfacial resistances, R, R prime and R double prime. 
And so our, uh, you know, our main finding from this work is that um, unlike what was found in the EPR experiments, um, where if you take um, the, the bilayer permeability and compare it to the permeability of a water layer of the same thickness. So here we have PM, the permeability of the membrane compared to water, uh, water layer of the same thickness. The EPR studies showed that there was um, a, actually an enhancement uh, that, that the membrane was more permeable than the surrounding water for POPC and less permeable for POPC with cholesterol, but almost the same. Okay, so there's not really a big difference there. But based on our studies using um, a simulation uh, water permeability, which is more native to, it, it's a more meaningful comparison than taking a, an experimental um, water layer uh, permeability because of the, essentially it's a, the factors of the simulation that affect the accuracy. Um, so if we compare the permeability of the membrane to the water layer uh, uh, permeability for the simulation itself, we end up with a factor of 10 difference. So that the membranes are 10 times less permeable than the water. And um, in addition, there's some difference between um, POPC and POPC with cholesterol. And with this kind of um, comparison, which takes out the thickness of the membrane as a factor, we see a reduction of about 10% um, between POPC and POPC cholesterol in terms of oxygen permeability. So to summarize the, the work here, um, we, have, we have found from the simulations that there is a strong interfacial oxygen resistance, um, which occurs in the head group region. So these are um, strong interfacial oxygen resistance peaks. And those were predicted by uh, Diamond and Katz. And that work has really been highly respected and in fact was um, interpreted or was used as a reference for those interpreting the EPR experiments as well. Um, but it was assumed that the interfacial resistances were within the integral um, so that they were catching them. Because of the presence of the TPC probe or tempocholine probe, um, which was meant to be targeting the head group region. But we find that that major interfacial resistance is not detected by the, the tempo probe. And as a result, we find that um, the membrane is less oxygen permeable than water. And we estimate here that it's by a factor of 10 uh, less permeable. And that there's a somewhat of a reduction by cholesterol. And actually I had, I'm realizing as I talk through this that um, I, Hal Schwartz and his colleagues have done some work previously that um, modified cholesterol content of cells. And we're, we're looking at the um, impact of cholesterol on the oxygen uh, measurements inside the cell versus outside and the gradient across the membrane. And it suggested, those studies suggested that cholesterol had a substantial impact, maybe about, um, I, I, if I remember correctly, it was around 20% um, effect on the, the gradient across the cell membrane. And it's very hard to explain. And we're sort of struggling with that and very interested in trying to to do a detailed study on that to compare, to understand uh, what's being measured exactly. Um, but we find that there is some reduction of the permeability by cholesterol, um, but it's not enough to explain the cellular studies, but, and it's probably not even close to enough to explain the cellular studies. So there's still some very interesting questions out there. And in addition, from some other work which I've done that uh, was recently published in the Journal of Physiology um, and, and actually summarizes a, a whole thrust of our work, we think that oxygen channeling within the bilayer may speed up oxygen delivery in the tissue itself. So move, moving oxygen inside the membrane across space um, or uh, even inside a series of membranes. So it's like a lipid network. Um, which was proposed much earlier than we picked it up. Um, but this does seem to be enhancing oxygen um, or accelerating oxygen movement through tissues. And then finally, um, the molecular modeling really does help to interpret the EPR data. And we're very interested in doing additional studies um, and would be highly interested in discussing collaborations um, to uh, interpret EPR data on looking at molecular level localization of the probes and um, what else might be going on. So this gives atomic uh, scale insights.
And I'd like to acknowledge our funding for this project was primarily through the New Mexico Inbrate Program, which is an NIH program um, that is it's a developmental award um, for institutions. And we also um, have been very steadily supported by uh, the Glendorn Foundation, which is a family foundation that supports breast cancer research. And by uh, recently by uh, matched funds from Clint EPR, um, which Hal Schwartz has, is the CEO of, of Clint EPR. And we really appreciate Hal and really his inspired um, me throughout the years and also made me think because <laughs> Sometimes I think I know what I have and then I have to think about it again. And I'd also really like to acknowledge my group. Um, and also Angela Hale is not pictured, but she contributed to the work as well. Um, and these are my group members and primarily, primarily Gotti um, contributed here. Thank you very much. And you know, it's always a little awkward giving a talk on a webinar because you feel like you're talking to yourself, um, but <laughs> we got through it. And if you guys have uh, questions, I'd be very interested in discussion. So thank you very much to Sally. This was really informative and I'm glad we all could gather by Zoom that we wouldn't have all been able to get together by person even though Zoom seems a little funny for the presenter. So I would like to encourage questions. I think, um, why don't you just um, open up your mic and go ahead and ask your question. If you're concerned about the mechanisms of doing that, um, I'll be monitoring chat, and so I'd be glad to read questions that come in through chat. So who would like to start the questions? I would just like to comment first that, uh, Sally, I have to leave. I'm late for an appointment, but I really enjoy your lecture. Thank you. And uh, some of it reminds me of boundary layer of theory in fluid flow. And, yes. Uh, so, yeah. Well, I better get going. And, and do you, you mean... Can I clarify there? So one thing that we know is that the water layers around the membranes um, may be less permeable than the membranes. So we think right. that that's true. And, yeah. and we still think that that's true. So right now, that's part of the reason we can't explain the effects of cholesterol that have been observed experimentally, um, is that the, this should be a fairly local effect where it wouldn't be rate limiting <laughs> for travel across a longer distance. But I think part of the reason we, we may be seeing uh, rate limiting effects or you know, effects that uh, do have an impact on the rate is that there's also the factor of oxygen traveling inside the membrane. And so the barrier becomes more important at that point. But also water is less soluble uh, or oxygen is less soluble in water or um, in cytosol and, and interstitial fluids than it is in water. Um, so we, we have that factor where we haven't considered the real um, aqueous environment either. So there's lots to lots to consider. Thank you, Dr. Brewing. I have to go, but thank you very much. Yes. Bye now. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for joining, Dr. Brewing. Go ahead, Hal. Okay. Well, hi, Sally. Hi, Hal. Uh, great presentation. Uh, thank you. Very controversial, uh, uh, and uh, very very interesting. Uh, uh, I. Uh, the concept that the membrane is, a, is an intrinsic barrier uh, has to blow a lot of people's minds and that lipids are less, uh, are, are, uh, are barriers to oxygen. Uh, it's certainly been an assumption. Uh, the opposite assumption has been made by everyone. Uh, right. Any, anyway, that, that, that's interesting and I think it'll be interesting to continue to pursue. Uh, Two, uh, what one question? Yeah. Uh, uh, are in your simulation, uh, you're necessarily simplifying. Uh, we know uh, from a variety of things that the presence of proteins right. in the membrane, uh, that some of those proteins are clearly uh, uh, essentially complete barriers to oxygen. And uh, is there a way of putting in, even uh, in, a, in an oversimplified way, uh, blocking out a certain percentage of your membrane with the proteins? Uh, and it would have two factors. One would be, it would be a complete barrier to oxygen, but it adds some interesting interface questions. Uh, and the second is it would then take the lipids 
and change the effective concentration of the lipids. So the, uh, the cholesterol uh, would be in a, in a much smaller uh, percentage of the membrane. Yes. Actually, because you've, you've asked us that question in the past, I have um, pursued that. And in fact, it, it's a very interesting question. It's funny because I, I always have difficulty figuring out how to, um, to sell this to national funding agencies because it seems so theoretical. And yet um, these questions really haven't been satisfactorily answered and really affect physiology and as well as clinical um, uses of, for example, oxygen measurements or interpretation of oxygen consumption and so forth. Um, but um, we have studied uh, the, the protein effects and they're very complex. <laughs> um, so we, we find that when we introduce proteins, they do provide, um, so, the first factor that you mentioned, Hal, is that they, they block the membrane, and that's true. So they, they reduce the permeability, permeability by a factor equivalent to the amount of area reduction of the lipid. Um, but then there's an additional effect, which has been observed. Also, um, Carl Subjinsky's group has done work with membrane proteins with EPR, and those results are pretty consistent with what we find also, which is that the um, there's an additional effect on the membrane around the, the protein. And explaining that requires additional work. Um, it was suggested that it causes the lipids to be more ordered around the surface of the protein, but I think it's probably more of a um, transient adhesion effect. So we see that oxygen sticks to the protein and then comes off. And so um, we don't fully understand what the, what the effects are, but, but various proteins have similar effects. So, and it's dependent on the, the circumference of the interface between the, the, or really the extent of the interface between the protein and the membrane. So clustering proteins tends to reduce their effect on, on membranes and might actually be part of what's advantageous of um, so org organization of membrane uh, proteins. So for example, rafts and other gatherings of proteins might help to improve the permeability of the membrane to oxygen as well as other solutes because more lipid is unaffected by the presence of the protein. It really reduces the, the interface. Um, but we also put in aquaporins, which have been um, suggested to enhance gas transport and particular oxygen transport. And we see that oxygen um, uses uses the channels in um, aquaporins to an extent, but we think that so far I have not been convinced that the advantage is significant um, if you have aquaporins which are dispersed or like not, um, not super abundant in the membrane because the oxygen actually has to find the channel. And even though it's faster to go that way, it, it takes longer for it to find it. And that's called access resistance. Um, but yes, the impact of cholesterol on all of this ends up being complex as well. And so we've done a study that we really should publish. We were, we're trying to cinch it up to publish it, but um, where we varied the, the protein content and then vari also varied the cholesterol. And we see some so fairly, fairly complex interplay between the two. Thank you. I have a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, Sally. So when we're talking about cell membrane, which cells we're talking about? Because cells are of different sizes and different properties. Right. And second question I have about your probe, uh, Stempo PC. What's the relax relaxation rate of these probe, relaxation times wow. of these probe on what field we have measured? That's a poke to me it? to look it up. I, I do not know. Um, they're roughly about uh, two to four microseconds uh, in the kinds of experiments that Carl was, was doing. Well, in fact, one of the things I would comment on in this regard is that the samples, at least you showed of your method dynamics experiments, show that there's a need uh, to compare uh, an a time ensemble average of your calculations with the EPR experiments, because the kind of experiment that uh, that Carl does uh, saturates for a very long time relative to what you show as a transport time. Okay. So he's, 
he's getting an average over uh, a large number of environments uh, of the uh, of the oxygen uh, and the nitroxide. The uh, I can't remember. I think most, of the, unfortunately, most of the work that people have done with the so-called doxal nitroxides and membranes have been more focused on motion and uh, T2 in line with effects rather than T1. Mm -hmm. But it's something you should look for because th they can be placed anywhere in the membrane. And uh, those early experiments with the doc labeled doxals uh, showed a lot of uh, what was then called vertical motion. So the uh, the systems you're looking at are, are moving, say, out of the membrane, into the membrane uh, quite a bit vertically uh, over the time right. scale you're talking of. Uh, and finally, I'd comment that with regard to this question of the, t of the nitroxide bending over, there's an experiment uh, I remember clearly, but not precisely, uh, when, maybe several decades ago, Betty Jean Gaffney did an experiment which she was hoping to label with two nitroxides on a long chain species uh, uh, studying membranes and found uh, to her, her dismay maybe uh, that uh, the, the two nitroxides uh, been over like, like this so that it was actually on the same side of the membrane. Uh, and it's an exact model for what you're talking about and bending over there. Uh, I'm sure you can find her paper from, I, th I think maybe 30 years or so ago. Tell me the name again, I'm sorry. Be Betty Jean Gaffney, G-A-F-F-N-E-Y. She did a lot of uh, work on nitroxides in biological okay. systems. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, we've, I actually discussed with Carl Sobzinski that, because um, he said, I could do that experiment, but this was several years ago. And he said, but I won't because I don't believe what you have. <laughs> but I, I think we're, we're more convincing now. We really didn't, we didn't have as much um, confidence in what we had then. Um, but it, it apparently can be done, and I'm, if, if it has been done, I'd like to see it. So thank you. And actually, the the I didn't mention it. I probably should have shown the the structures. But the besides the head group probe, the others are doxels, um, and so there there are doxel probes placed at various bilayer depths um, yeah. throughout. Yeah, I wasn't clear about that. But. The other feature is that uh, this your time scales calculated suggest a comparison experiment, which uh, Carl has a capability of doing now uh, because they have a five, uh, a Bruker spectrometer up there now. And that is to compare an inversion recovery experiment with a saturation recovery experiment. The inversion right. recovery uh, will do things on say a 20 or 40 nanosecond time scale as opposed to the uh, several hundred nanosecond time scale of a saturation recovery experiment. Hmm. Okay. So, now, now that Jim is retired, I think Carl could do the experiment. So to be clear, um, no, I don't think time is a significant factor here um, because we don't actually, we're not doing anything explicit with probes. And I didn't explain that either. So we're, we're taking the membrane with no probes and we're calculating the oxygen distribution across the membrane and we've done free energy as well and things like that but but we can um, look at oxygen movement across the membrane but it's not dependent on any kind of relaxation time because we don't have a probe present and so it's a bulk property and it's very consistent so if we run for a microsecond it's the same as running for uh, well you really need at least 300 nanoseconds typically to get the sampling um, no, but I, it doesn't I, change the profile. My, my point is simply the comparison with the experiment. Right. The, the experiment is time averaging a different thing than you are. So when you're trying to compare the, the other experiments we have on collisions with oxygen uh, with your simulations, uh, it's, it's getting averaged over a different time scale. Right. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, if I may ask a question. Yes, thank, thank you for your talk. It, it is fascinating and it really has uh, deep uh, consequences for all of us, I think. But uh, I wanted to touch about the what you said about the channeling. So do we understand correctly that it doesn't really matter the composition of the, uh, of the uh, lipid bilayer? Uh, 
is it important or any bilateral bilateral would be okay or do they have the yes, same? Yes, that's a good question. So, and actually, I think uh, Magnani also asked something similar. So, what kind of bilayer are we talking about? So, uh, essentially, I think the simplest thing we could say is this is most representative of a red blood cell bilayer because they're very simple. Um, however, um, other cells have, most of them don't have 50% cholesterol, but some uh, cancer cells have close to that. But it's also, you know, there's a, an experimental issue here, at, at least from my perspective. I have not been able to find compositions in detail of most bilayers. Now, there are some, but whether they're relevant in particular to oxygen metabolism uh, tends to be uh, uncertain. And so actually, one of the things I would like to do, I've been looking at the blood-brain barrier um, because their aquaporins are important and might be affecting oxygen uh, flux. But... Um, and it would be nice to have an, you know, a pretty resolved lipid composition for the blood-brain barrier, or the actually it's the astrocyte input membranes in the brain that then um, are attaching to the essentially interfacing with the blood-brain barrier. But I don't have great experimental models, um, but I'm working on that, and it's a really good question because I think people tend to wonder, well, okay, is this really general? And essentially the the take home message based on a lot of studies and most of them theoretical simulation studies is that yes, the membrane composition doesn't matter very much. Um, and except for the protein composition and by protein composition, I mean amount of protein. It doesn't seem to matter what kind of protein. Um, and protein composition doesn't vary. Uh, well, I don't think that the amount of protein varies that much in most cells, most cell types, um, but it's very high in mitochondria, which is interesting, in places where oxygen utilization and production, so photosynthesis um, in thylakoid membranes and mitochondria, those membranes have huge amounts of protein. We're talking, uh, I want to say 75 weight percent. Um, and some, but when you look carefully, um, at least when I've tried to analyze approximately how much of those proteins are spanning the membrane, it's a much smaller percentage. So you've got these huge parts of proteins that are attached to the membrane, but the part that goes across, sometimes it's only one helix. And that's true for um, the glyco, um, for the protein that's really um, predominant in a red blood cell membranes, uh, glycophorin, I think it is, um, which has a, a single um, helix spanning the red blood cell. But maybe this could help explain why we only have these, these small membrane spanning pieces. Uh, but yes, so essentially, um, that's a very good question and something I think will really help us with funding when we can figure out like what are some meaningful membranes to model and do we have really specific lipid composition data on these. Um, but when I've seen others attempt this, it really doesn't make that much difference, except that cholesterol does affect the lateral organization of saturated and unsaturated lipids. And there was a really nice study that a colleague of mine did, and actually she received the Nisley Award this year from I thought um, Anne Hessels from Belgium, um, and she showed that um, the distribution of cholesterol affects positions where oxygen can get through more easily, and water too. So it's um, the pe permeability is laterally inhomogeneous in, in the plane of the membrane. So it depends on where you are trying to get across if you're looking at um, kind of raft mimics. Uh, so, yeah, but I guess like we would expect with biology, these are really robust systems, right? So the perturbations don't have as much effect as you would think, which is kind of discouraging from a, you know, when you do experimental design, you're like, oh, cholesterol is going to make an effect. But then we find, well, the biological system has some compensation for this. And, um, I think that the, somebody asked, I think, if the channeling was the same in all compositions. And I think that cholesterol enhances channeling based on what I've seen. Um, but I don't know the effect of proteins on that process. And it's been difficult for us to develop techniques for studying it. Um, but um, we would like to see whether proteins hinder or, or are, um, do not have an impact on, on this lateral uh, transfer or the movement of oxygen inside the membrane channel.
So the reason I ask this question is that I was thinking like we have a biology lab, we have a pulse instrument and uh, we can actually run a lot of uh, ah. if it is two to four microsecond. We can really run a lot of uh, such experiments. <laughs> I would love to I talk just, with you about that. Yeah, then, We can uh, discuss it separately. I guess a disadvantage for me. So I'm at a small institution, which, you know, I've, I've been amazed at what we can do here. Um, one of the disadvantages is that we, um, it's challenging to find people to do, you know, you don't have just infinite resources, right? So finding the right people to do the experiments would be wonderful. And I'd be really super interested in that. And we can uh, talk separately. Okay, so uh, it's very nice talk, Shelly. Uh, this is Nitin from O2M. Uh, I have uh, two questions. So one question is related to one that, uh, 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 you know, you said like, you know, the cholesterol does have effect on the, uh, the, uh, the oxygen, uh, uh, you know, uh, transport, but, you know, the, and the cholesterol head group, it again undergoes like acetylation, like let's say like lots of fatty acid get attached and it does found effect in various cancers and all. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are you guys have also consider the effect of the acetylation, uh, of the cholesterol head group, or you are just simply considering only the overall cholesterol, not whether it's like, whether be it's being acetylated or it's a pre, uh, pre head group? That's a great question. I have not. And in fact, I wasn't aware of acetylation as a modification on cholesterol, but I have known about, so for example, hydroxylation happens. So you have oxidation events that affect the cholesterol um, oxidation. And we have not looked at that. Um, so my sense is just the thinking of acetylation, it's likely that that would change the interaction of the cholesterol with lipids. And there's also cholesterol esterification. And I don't know if that's, that's probably not what you're talking about, but um, yes. so esterification so would be attaching a tail to it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The, oh, okay. The, yeah, so it's okay. like- so when the cholesterol is attached to a, a lipid, like you have a tail and um, then a head group and so forth. We have not checked that, but I have been interested in checking it. Um, I don't, just prediction, um, I would expect that that would actually reduce the bilayer permeability by more because part of what cholesterol does is that it reduces the number of head groups per, uh, on average, right? So you have these, um, the cholesterols without a head group, and then they cause the a loosening of the head group region, which reduces the barrier, uh, the main barrier to oxygen transport. So if you were to not lose that barrier and add cholesterol, you would have a greater reduction. So that's a great question. And if I could understand the physiological significance of it um, in terms of where we would see it and, um, and what you think, that, you know, why it would be important to ask, I would be very interested in doing that. Yeah, yes, yeah. so that's what actually I was thinking. Thanks for that. So I was thinking like in the way of the, in the cancers, like, like in, the, in, in case of cancer, you know, there is increase in the secretion of these acetylate, acetylating enzymes, such as like, you know, acetyltransferase, SOT1, okay. SOT2. And, uh, you know, uh, does that having some sort of relation because increasing sort of that acetylation, which mm -hmm. ultimately decreasing the rate of oxygen transportation and ultimately creating the hypoxia sort of things. Uh, so I was just curious in that uh, perspective. Uh, so, yeah, Thanks. second. Thank you. Yeah, so second question that I am having that you said like you were using uh, this oximetry probe. So mm -hmm. are you guys are doing some sort of, uh, you know, localized experiment? Because I believe like if you have very long lipidic chain and if you have the probe, uh, you know, added to your cell culture or, or, or in the tissue, it may get uh, stuck into the, into the lipidic bilayer and may remain in the same place where it has been uh, sort of adsorbed, right? So, or how, how do you, uh, okay. uh, yeah. So it depends. So these probes that for the study that I was comparing against, um, those probes are lipid conjugated. So they're actually attached to certain points uh, uh, going across the membrane. Um, so at specific carbons, essentially of, of the lipid, but so I don't think, so localization is a problem, but it's a very local problem, right? So we're talking a 20 angstrom play and where the, or maybe 10, 
um, and where the probe could be. But for actually, this is my question for, for Hal. Um, so, well, I'm not sure that I'm asking you, but it's for your work that you've done in the past. Um, there was some, uh, you used a probe-based um, study, but it was a probe that was similar to a tempo, but it was not attached to a lipid. And we saw, uh, or those studies indicate a very large gradient across the membrane. Um, and what I have thought is that that probe may be localizing to the membrane itself, um, which might be reflecting the membrane permeability more directly than really the gradient um, between the cytosol and the extracellular um, region. And so I do think loca location is important, particularly when you have a probe that's not attached to a lipid. So the studies we did, Sally, uh, to measure intracellular gradients, uh, we used probes that either stayed in the extracellular compartment and weren't on the membrane. Uh, you wouldn't right. expect them to be on the membrane or probes that were inside the membrane and in fact, couldn't cross the membrane. So, so, so they this, were localized they inside were, the so membrane? We were not measuring in the membrane at all. Right, so you said, you mean inside the cells? Um, so we measured inside the cell, Right. In, in the cytoplasm inside the cell, or we measured outside the cell. Uh, right. And uh, we really didn't do any uh, any gradient studies uh, in the membrane. Right. And actually, I just thought of an experiment because um, what I think, and you know, I I may may not know. So I was thinking of doing a study with the probe that you had used. It was N N15 PDT, I think, um, yeah. which which is similar to a tempo. And because of the chemical nature of that, I suspect it may be inside the membrane, even though it's assumed to be in the cytosol. And we could actually do an experiment where we have a, a tempo attached to a lipid and, a, and the NPDT not attached to the lipid separately and see if they get the same, same gradient. Because uh, yeah, um, so then the, we could tell. The, yeah. the PDT, the tempo, uh, has about a two times greater solubility in uh, in lipids than it does in uh, the, than it does in uh, aqueous compartments, but okay. quantitatively, the uh, amount of lipid that's in the membrane is a pretty small fraction of the total amount of lipid in a okay. cell. So uh, you can, in fact, numerically uh, ignore. Uh, the membrane uh, mm. because it would be a small perturbation. Uh, and that's, the, the, oh, that's okay. true of real cells. Uh, the, uh, the, the membrane, the extra, the cell membrane uh, is very important, but very small. And okay, so, uh, so oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I think okay, and it's only a factor of two, maybe that's, yeah. Yep. I think it's a wonderful discussion, but it seems like attendance is falling off as people have other commitments to go to. So I would thank everybody for their contributions and encourage you to have additional questions to work together by email or set up your private Zoom or whatever. But uh, thank you for inspiring lots of discussion. And we look forward to meeting again in a couple of weeks to hear more from Mark Saitland.